Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call this City Council meeting to order tonight, Monday, March 6, 2023. This is a regular business meeting of the Bloomington City Council. Thanks for joining us here in the Council Chambers, and thanks for joining us online. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you're able, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. We, Council, have a what we like to call a very manageable meeting this evening. Our agenda is very manageable. Uh, first order of business is to approve the agenda, and we start with uh, three introductory items, a proclamation regarding Women's History Month, uh, an update, and then two updates and work plans, uh, the Advisory Board of Health 2022 Annual Report and a 2023 work plan, and the Creative Placemaking Commission 2022 Update and 2023 work plan. We have our consent agenda with 13 items on our consent agenda. And then we have under item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we have uh, one hearing for a new therapeutic massage enterprise license. And then we wrap up the evening with item 5.1, our council policy and issue update. As I said, a very manageable agenda this evening. Council, any corrections or additions to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I would move tonight's agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept tonight's agenda as presented. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Uh, just a note, uh, Councilmember Lowe not with us this evening, so uh, votes will be six council members, and it's passed 6-0, so thank you very much for that. Our first item then tonight with the agenda that we just approved is a proclamation for Women's History Month, and I'm gonna head down to the podium. Now, I understand we've got some Bloomington staff members here who are going to come up and support me as I read the, the proclamation. Standing behind here. We have a proclamation. Uh, I believe this is the first time we've had this proclamation presented for the city of Bloomington. It's a proclamation for Women's History Month, March 2023. Whereas Women's History Month originated in 1981 when the United States Congress passed a resolution authorizing and requesting the president proclaim the week beginning March 7, 1982 as Women's History Week. And whereas, after being petitioned by the National Women's History Project, Congress passed a resolution that designated the month of March 1987 as Women's History Month. And whereas since 1995 United States presidents have issued annual proclamations designating the month of March as Women's History Month. And whereas these proclamations celebrate the contributions women have made to the United States and recognize the specific achievements women have made over the course of American history in a variety of fields. And whereas black, indigenous, and women of color, undocumented women, women with disabilities, women with children, queer and transgender women, and women who live at the intersections of these identities offer unique and valuable perspectives and contributions. And whereas the city endeavors to create a culture that values the contributions of all employees and provides equal opportunity for professional development and career advancement. And whereas in 2022, a new city employee resource group was formed to support employees who identify as women and their allies. And whereas the Women's Employees Resource Group brings together individuals in an inclusive way to provide resources and support for women, to create awareness around women issues that women face and make a positive impact for women in our organization and our community. And whereas female persons make up 52% of Bloomington's population, yet represent 35% of the city's full-time workforce. And whereas the Women's Employee Resource Group has and will continue to offer recommendations on action steps to support, retain, and recruit female leaders to the city of Bloomington's workforce. Now therefore I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim March of 2023 as Women's History Month in Bloomington, 
and invite the community to celebrate the vital role of women in American history and explore historical resources at womenshistorymonth.gov. And I would add, uh, not only invite the community to celebrate the vital role of women in American history, but the vital role of women in Bloomington's history. It wasn't so long ago that we had a, a seven-member city council made up entirely of women. And uh, we have seen leadership throughout City Hall in a variety of positions, in a variety of roles, uh, highest the level of staff, uh, highest level of elected officials, uh, our, our mayor, Coral Hool. We have seen women in leadership positions throughout the city of Bloomington, and I want to make sure that we just don't recognize this as the leaders uh, in American history, but in Bloomington's history as well. And I want to congratulate the Bloomington uh, Women's, the Women's Employee Resource Group, WERG, W-E-R-G is what I was told the uh, acronym is. Uh, 22 active members now, congratulations to that group. We have representatives here with us this evening, so thank you very much for being here, and I'm very glad uh, that this uh, was pulled together, and it was a, it was a ground up type organization, that it was at the request of of uh, the women in our, our professional organization that they wanted this to be part of the, uh, the city of Bloomington organizational culture. And um, so congratulations. We have an official proclamation, which by the way was much too small, so I had to read a much bigger version of it. So congratulations, I wanna present this and if you could share that with the rest of the folks. Lovely. All right. Thank you so much. Quick, we'll do a quick picture. I know you don't wanna, didn't wanna do a Griffin grin, but we'll just do a grin. <laughs> Make sure you're looking at the right one. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. The next two items on our agenda, item 2.2 and 2.3, uh, are part of a, a requirement that we have as a city council. Every year we're required to uh, hear annual reports and, and approve work plans for our boards and commissions, and we've got two of them this evening. We will start with item 2.2, which is the 2022 annual report and the 2023 work plan for our advisory board of health. And with us this evening, we have the past two chairs of our advisory board of health. We have Jasmine, Jasmine, I'm going to butcher your name, so I'm, Jasmine Bedford, we'll go with that, and uh, Star Sage, who are the past two chairs of our advisory board of health. So come up, good evening, and welcome. Dr. Kelly, are you going to join as well? I'll be here for questions. Very good. Great. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor Bussey, members of uh, Bloomington City Council. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Jasmine Swinnigan Bedford. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. That. Um, you just got to go with it. Uh, and I was the chair of the Advisory Board of Health for uh, the year 2022-2023. And then we have um, Star Sage, who's the incoming chair for 2023-2024. So pleased to present to you um, our annual report. And then Star will present our work plan for next year. Um, that's very small writing there, but um, this is a letter stating uh, the work that we had done over the past year, really talking about um, setting the stage for future endeavors that we want to do, looking at uh, really what we spent this past year doing was getting a lot of information around the problems around um, the city of Bloomington relating to environmental health, um, public health, housing, um, community development, and things like that. Um, so really setting the stage for a year that um, STAR will be leading where we can, you know, bring initiatives to you. Um, so the purpose of the Advisory Board of Health is to study issues affecting the health of Bloomington residents and make recommendations to the City Council as they perform their duties as a community health board. So again, we had um, looked at just different intersections around environmental health, um, sustainability, public health, housing, um, housing and health. Um, and, and that was a lot of the work that we had done this past year. On the next slide, uh, we have the members of the current Advisory Board of Health, or I should say the 2022 members. So we had three consumer men members, Ronald Bustamante Ortega, Chelsea Eichen, and Andrea Puckett. And then we had three provider members, Star Sage, Jackie Seward, and then myself. 
Um, and then the staff advisor was Nick Kelly, um, the administrator for public health. And then we had um, staff board members, board secretaries, Nevo and Linda Ris risky Lundin. Um, and then our SCHSAC representative was uh, city council member Jenna Carter with Nick Kelly as the alternate. Um, we had a number of meetings this past year. Uh, the schedule was pretty similar to years past. The only um, you know, main difference was we foregone the October meeting so that Star and I could attend a meeting from the Community Relations Department, um, bringing together a number of the uh, members from other boards and commissions, really starting that conversation about how we can work together um, and bring initiatives to you, you know, kind of in a more unified fashion uh, moving forward. We had a number of presentations from city staff and public health staff focused on environmental health, parks and rec, um, housing and redevelopment, sustainability, um, and, and also I want to add here um, racial equity as well. That was kind of a, a common theme throughout the conversations we were having. And then in addition to city staff and public health staff, we had um, Cheryl and Diana uh, from Cornerstone and Bridging um, uh, really speaking about issues of domestic violence and housing security and how, this, how organizations within the city of Bloomington are supporting not only Bloomington residents, but residents from Edina, Richfield, and Minneapolis as well. And we had really rich conversations around what the Advisory Board of Health can do and what City Council can do um, to support a lot of these really import important initiatives. Um, so the next two slides are, are pretty packed. Again, um, talking about all of the information that we had gathered over the past year. Um, so we spoke about COVID-19 because we can't get away from COVID-19. Um, hopefully we'll be speaking about it less upcoming. Um, we talked uh, you know, about Cornerstone, the work that they do with domestic and sexual violence. Um, uh, Bloomington Public Health, the work that they're doing around accreditation, the annual report, and all of that. Um, the flu clinic proposal, um, also tying together, um, you know, climate change, food accessibility, environmental health, um, foodborne illness trends as well. And then on the next slide, continuing on our um, reports that we received. We had a really good conversation around um, housing, um, looking at affordable opportunities, uh, and, and, you know, also talking a lot about renter health, too. So it was, you know, trying to get, you know, more first-time homeownership in Bloomington, but also looking at renter, rentership and how we can, you know, make renters' health, you know, better in the city. Um, looking at smoke-free housing, um, park systems, making those more inclusive uh, for, you know, everybody within the city, um, emergency preparedness, and then um, pop health and planning as well. And so with that, I'll pass it to Star to talk about uh, what we're looking at for the next year. Oh, you have a mic. Here. <laughs> um, yeah, so we already heard and you're all familiar with what our purpose is, um, and so essentially, we Sorry, were, excuse me if I could. It, it, if you sure. could just, you could leave the mask on, but if you could just move the uh, microphone closer to okay. you. It, it is mobile, so you could. Okay, I can take it off. Just want to make sure everybody can hear it. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, so we, we heard about purpose, and um, we really essentially are reporting to the council and sometimes making recommendations for things um, that we would like to see the council support. And so on the next slide, our actions that we take and the things that we do sort of fall into one of three buckets. So research and report, um, study and comment, which is um, the main sort of mechanism I think that we utilize, and you'll see that on the next slide when we talk about what we're doing in the coming year. And then the third option um, is on the next slide, evaluate and recommend. And so we're working towards getting, I think, to the point of um, more recommendation. Um, but our plan for the coming year, um, I guess I should last mention the last point too, um, in terms of supporting events, engaging in things like um, the um, Diamond Service Awards and Food Safety Awards, and really just supporting the council in ways that we can um, it, when it comes to community settings as well. So our plan for the coming year is on the next slide. And so the little folder designates the study and comment, which like I mentioned is probably our most common action. 
And so in January, we uh, focused on climate change and health and started talking about our coming uh, work plan for the next um, sort of year. And then in February, um, we um, approved our plan and talked some about uh, school health. So the the challenges that uh, K through 12 system is facing and the new data that just came out around um, chemical health and mental health challenges um, in Minnesota schools. Uh, and then in March, uh, like Jasmine said, COVID is ongoing for us. And so we're getting updates on COVID and environmental health as well regularly. Jasmine also mentioned that renter health is a, a theme that sort of emerged for us and we're carrying into next year. Um, and we're really looking towards trying to make a difference in, in the area of renter health and improving um, access and eliminating disparities for folks who rent versus folks with less resources who may be homeowners. Um, so in April, that will be our area of focus. We'll also be talking about National Public Health Week, which falls early in April um, in the proclamation. We're really excited for May oh, when we have the joint advisory board meeting. So we'll be meeting with the cities of Edina and Richfield as well. And that's something that I haven't done while I'm on the board. Is that a, a new, so that's a new thing um, that the boards will be doing coming together to talk about collaboration and network. So we're really excited about that. Next slide. Um, then in June, racism as a public health crisis. Um, we'll be talking about, uh, we'll also be reading and reviewing um, the annual division report uh, for public health. We don't meet over the summer, so when we reconvene in the fall in September, we'll be looking at you know updates and emergency preparedness. Again, renter health and health and all policies. Um, as we move into sort of the winter, again, carrying that renter health theme with us um, and COVID uh, as well. And we regularly get community partner updates, which are sort of interspersed throughout, throughout our plan across the months. I think next slide. Oh, okay. I thought there was one more slide, but that's it. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say the Advisory Board of Health is probably a, about as much under the radar in terms of our boards and commissions as we have. But my goodness, you're busy. You've got a lot going on, and especially the last couple of years, considering, considering everything. So I appreciate your work, and thank you so very much. Council, yeah. questions? This evening, Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I was like, which question do I ask first? No. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you so much for your leadership in Bloomington and the work that you're doing. Um, obviously, public health is near and dear to my heart as well. Um, so I guess I just, uh, so first of all, I guess I was very excited to see or to hear, I mean, you say the words, that this is the year where you're bringing initiatives to us or you're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, because I do feel like I've seen the opportunity um, for the Advisory Board of Health to do kind of more of that kind of work. Um, I'm really grateful for the input and the advice around the tobacco ordinances, but I just think that there are a variety of issues impacting our community, like you mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so I'm looking at the minutes from, I think, January, where you talked about climate change and health. And I'm not, like, I see kind of an overview of what the discussion was, but not really a lot on, like, what the council should do about it. And so I guess, and I know you said that it's not really, you're not making specific recommendations or voting on specific recommendations, but as you move forward, do you kind of see more kind of ideas being generated? Because I would love to work on more public health issues and mm -hmm. um, and get ideas from the Advisory Board of Health. So. Yeah, so I mean, we had a brainstorming session and I think one of our challenges is we've had some turnover on the mm -hmm. board and so we've had folks who are, I think we're the senior members and we came yeah. on in 2000, 2021. Yes. Um, yeah. And so we've had a lots of other turnover. And so at our brainstorming session, the main sort of commonality that we landed on was do something. <laughs> we want mm -hmm. to do something or um, feel like we are able to make a recommendation um, to, to the council. And so I would say that that is our priority um, for hopefully the coming year and beyond. Um, 
I too, I'm a professor of public health, and so I absolutely am committed to this and really would like to be able to help influence change that's health promotive in, in my home community. So yeah. I plan to take that with me as I sort of lead um, the board into the next year as well. Awesome. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add to that is um, climate change is another topic that seems to be kind of folded into um, all of the discussions that we have. So we talk about racial equity and we talk about climate change and how we can kind of fold those into any initiatives that we want to do. Um, so specifically surrounding renter health, that seems to be like the direction, directionally where we want to go. Um, but, you know, bringing in those other themes as well. Well, I did love in true public health fashion that it seemed like 2022 was like an assessment year. Yes. And 2023 <laughs> is about figuring yes. out what the, the next steps are. So, yes. Um, okay, that, that, that is really helpful to hear. Uh, the only other two comments I guess I had was that um, obviously, you know, we're uh, hopefully going to be looking at building a new community center and public health facility. And so I guess yes. I'm just wondering what will be the Advisory Board of Health's role in those conversations. And then also, obviously, we are um, part of a pretty large effort to get the, the, an expo coming you know, to Minnesota, to Bloomington, with uh, a theme around health. And so I guess I'm curious what will be the Advisory Board of Health's role in those expo conversations. And, and that might not be something the two of you can answer. Maybe that's Dr. Kelly, or maybe that's something to be figured out in the future. But I would hope that the Advisory Board of Health has a role in those discussions. Dr. Kelly? Mayor, Councilmember Carter. As far as uh, uh, the future facility options, uh, the advisory board will be- oh, To clarify, I just mean the, the new building that hopefully we will be built, yes. not the interim solution. So. Uh, correct. Uh, the advisory board of health will be a part of that process of helping us plan. So as we do things with our staff in other partners on that process. Um, we'll be keeping the Advisory Board of Health abreast of that process of what's going on, get feedback, suggestions. They don't meet in our building right now and it'd be really nice to have the meeting in our building again too. And then on the Expo, there are lots of ideas that we have for how to engage the board and highlight the amazing work Minnesota does on a global stage um, that uh, I look forward to having more conversations about come July. Christopher Brugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Carter, we must have been uh, telepathically communicating because I have uh, just this evening sent a message out to all of the commission and board liaisons uh, that uh, we need to get on their agendas in July and August to talk about how Expo uh, will uh, impact the, the city and specifically the purview of each of those commissions and uh, talk about how to include them as we move forward. So that's on our to-do list. Council, additional questions? Council Member Nelson and Council Member D'Alessandro. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to follow up on one of the areas you were going to work on with regards to the schools, and you indicated the uh, chemical and mental health needs. Um, and, and that made me think of um, uh, the THC uh, thing. And are, are you playing a role in any of that and, and potentially advising us in terms of how we address that? I know our regulatory framework currently is based on tobacco. Um, my personal opinion, we should maybe be more looking at intoxicating substances like liquor and, and not tobacco. Uh, but we also have a way huge unknown because of the legislature and what they're going to do with marijuana and clean them up with their THC mess that they, they gave us. So I guess my question is, what role is that or kind of a wait and see to see what the legislature does? Or um, do you have any proactive steps that you're looking at there? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Nelson. Uh, right now, it's been some information sharing at a really high level. There's so much unknown about what's gonna happen at the legislator and whether or not we can have a local role um, from a public health standpoint. Um, and so as that gets more clarified, uh, we'll be engaging the board on, on what our next steps can be on that. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you. 
Um, thanks, Councilmember Carter, for asking the question about Expo. That was going to be number one for me. The second one um, is related to the Bloomington School Health discussion. Was there any discussion in your February meeting, or, or do you still have follow-up plans related to um, nutrition in schools? Um, I, I've asked, uh, I, I think I had in my conversation with uh, uh, City Manager of Abrugi recently, you know, could we get a little bit of a some conversation happening between the city and the schools around nutrition? I've I've received some information from uh, residents and things like that, suggesting that um, things are not at the level that they would like to see them, and especially with the free lunch program that's being funded now at the state level and everything. So I'm curious, what, did it come up? If if it's if it's on your radar, what what are you thinking, and and how how might you approach that? Um, and how can we help as, as liaisons to the school board as well? Yeah, I mean, I will say that that did not come up. Um, that wasn't the focus of the meeting was about the data that was recently released from the statewide survey of students. And it was focused on mental health, chemical health. Um, and then they also talked about their anti-racism work that they're doing in the school district. So it didn't come up, but I think it's an area that I think would be of interest to the board too, and an area that we can, I'm taking notes, so that, that we can add to, to explore. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add to that is um, when they left our meeting, they said, you know, don't be a stranger. We'd love to come back and continue to talk about various issues around, you know, health um, in all aspects and in the schools. So it, I think it would be fairly easy for us to um, bring them back and engage in a conversation around nutrition. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a quick comment. Um, I would echo the concern around nutrition in the schools. Sure. I think before the pandemic, I mean, I used to go into the cafeteria and help serve lunch at least once a month, and it was fantastic. But I think um, with the uh, changes, the variances that were given during the pandemic, there has just been a change in what's being served. Okay. And then in addition, my understanding is that most days school lunches are served on styrofoam trays. So there's a climate change um, lens to this and then also just a nutrition and health of our children lens and so just wanted to um, echo that I think this is an important conversation for us to have sure yeah. thank you council unless there are further questions thank you thanks for thank being you. here with us this evening and please pass our thanks on to the rest of the uh, the, the board and uh, let, let them know we appreciate the work that you are doing yeah, for the city be. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Council item 2.3 on our agenda is uh, the 2022 update and the 2023 work plan for our Creative Placemaking Commission. And with us tonight, we have our Director of Creative Placemaking, Alejandra Palenka, and a Commissioner on our Creative Placemaking Commission, Jamie Schumacher. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Hello, Mayor, Council Members. I'm sorry, but how do I click forward? Just tell me. Just go to you? Okay. Um, hello, um, my name is Alejandra Palenka and I'm the Director of Creative Placemaking. I'm Jamie Schumacher, I'm a Creative Placemaking Commissioner and Bloomington resident. And today we'll be providing an overview of 22 projects, 2022 projects and our 2023 work plan and Commissioner Schumacher will kick it off for us. Thank you. Um, so uh, the Creative Placemaking Plan vision and goals have guided our work plan strategies and project priorities. Um, so our vision is the sustained creative placemaking efforts will establish the South Loop as a distinctive destination known for welcoming people and using the arts to transform the neighborhood physically, socially, and culturally. Um, and the goals of that South Loop specific plan were urbanism, animation, involvement, identity, leadership, and investment. And those are expanded upon in the work plan document that you have. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, in 2020, the commission participated in a practical visioning workshop. Um, you can, uh, we asked ourselves, given what we know of our creative placemaking plan, what elements do we want to see in the next three years as a result of our actions between 2021 and 2023? And we agreed to focus our efforts on initiatives that would support the following elements, grand and colorful places to play, welcoming and thriving green spaces, walkable, engaging urban amenities, cohesive distinctive wayfinding, intentional and equitable engagement of stakeholders, and a safe and accessible mobility hub. 
All right, and with that, I'll go through a few of our 2022 projects. So we installed two sculptures that are part of our Creative Sparks program. One is Street Seat by Greg Mueller, and the other is Blooming Ribbon by Kao Li Tao. Next slide. As part of our neighborhood focus project, this is actually outside and funded outside of the South Loop District. We developed the Hometown Poetry Program, and we received 140 applications, so poem submissions. 18 were selected by a stakeholder panel, and 12 are made into sidewalk stamps, and four of them into creative sign installations. So selected ages, selected um, Poets ages ranged from 10 to 95 years old. 50% of them were youth and 50% were BIPOC and we had all Bloomington zip codes um, represented. We held a poetry reading at a packed room in the Oxboro Library in September and poems were in display both at Oxboro Library and here at Civic Plaza. As a creative way to promote South Loop District and area businesses, we placed a South Loop ice wall at the Old Cedar Avenue Bridge during the Luminary Hike, which was in partnership with the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge, and a sculpture placed in front of Fiddlehead Coffee Co. Uh, during the Metro-wide Ice Sculpture Exploration. We're currently developing a community garden space next to the vacant lot, or within the vacant lot next to the new fire station number three at 86th and Old Shakopee. And this is again, we're back in South Loop. In 2022, we developed site plan designs based on our engagement efforts and hosted an open house in August to get feedback from the neighborhood. This is also a project that was outside of South Loop District that we partnered with the HRA and community development on. And we really thought about placemaking in this area and framed our efforts around these questions. How can we support a more enticing, safe pedestrian uh, experience or environment that encourages stopping, which in turn creates opportunities for community engagement and cross patronage of businesses? What experiences could improve the social and commercial vitality of the intersection and serve the surrounding community? And how can we build momentum toward future economic and development investments? So just as a first step, we developed a survey to get a better understanding of people's vision, wants, needs within this community. We also set up a Let's Talk Bloomington project page where survey results can be found. We worked with the area businesses here to develop a small pop-up event in October and to activate a portion of the parking lot in front of the Eagles, which were very helpful hosts. Uh, the event included things like live music, food from the Eagles, we had a food truck. We also encouraged patronage at Euro's Grill with a coupon and some family-friendly activities. And really it was just also a good way for us to connect with neighbors and share information, for example, of upcoming road construction plans. We now continue to work with multiple businesses at this intersection to get an understanding of how we can support their business through small scale improvements. So some projects that we're working on include Euro's Dali uh, storefront update, a customized bench for Ocean Blue Tattoo, new signage for Johnny Rock Bikes, and more to be installed this spring and summer. This is a mock-up as you can see here, but I think if it's not installed, it will be probably this week. So check it out if you're driving by. A few other projects we worked on this year include participation in various efforts such as the community strategic planning, the Pride event, and the Small Business Development Center advisory committee meetings. We also worked on artwork maintenance and installed 13 new artwork plaques that provide a QR code to direct people to our South Loop audio tour on the AutoCast app. And a shout out to Public Works who not only installed these plaques but they help us so much through a lot of our projects. We also distributed two artist workbooks but from Springboard for the Arts, Artists Working in Community, and Work of Art Business Skills for Artists. And we, we provided these to 68 Bloomington residents as part of our efforts to grow local artist capacity. Next I'll talk about our 2023 work plan efforts. So here you can actually see the fabricated uh, poetry signs and sidewalk stamps for the Hometown Poetry Project. Um, they're gonna be installed starting in early summer. The signs in four parks within that neighborhood focus area and the stamps really can be used and they can be used over again in, throughout the entire city. So it's a really great um, way to spread the wealth throughout the entire city. 
so to say. Construction for the South Loop Community Garden will be begin right away in the spring. Here's a draft uh, rendering of a canopy to be installed on site and a somewhat final plan of the site plan. There might have been a few tweaks to this, but this is a gives you a good idea of how the site will be developed. We're also partnering with Public Art St. Paul on their WACPA Triennial Art Festival, which will take place June 24th through September 16th. Bloomington will be promoting events that align with their WACPA theme of, um, of I'm sorry, my, my notes kind of blanked out here, um, but throughout their network of mutuality theme. Latino Conservation Week Festival is one event that we'll be promoting on July 22nd. We're partnering with the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. And that event will include food, music, and then art activities, installations, and performances from indigenous roots. We'll also begin engagement efforts during this time to help inform the development of an installation down at Old Cedar Avenue Bridge at the trailhead. And that will focus on water and the indigenous history of the area. We'll also be organizing a presentation to highlight our South Loop history report more in the fall area, likely in August or September. So one of our top priorities uh, is ongoing support of the Small Business Development Center. Uh, so this summer we will support juxtaposition arts as they use creative placemaking as a strategy for engagement during the design process and integrate opportunities for creative placemaking into long-term site and programming plans. Some additional projects this year include the Making It Public workshop, which was facilitated by Forecast Public Art and that we hosted here in Civic Plaza in January, also to help grow local artist capacity. We have a sculpture by artist team Safa Sarvastani and Shirin Gurashi at Bloomington Central Station Park. And we have a, we'll begin development of a third round of our Creative Sparks program. And of course, very importantly, the development of a citywide creative placemaking plan, an outcome of community strategic planning process and support from the Housing and Redevelopment Authority. We're currently requests on we're cu currently working on a request for proposals, and engagement will be a vital component of the development of this plan, which will take place throughout the next year. So before I wrap up, I'd also just like to take a moment to acknowledge artistry as a longtime important partner of our work. And our formal partnership is on hold just as they navigate some organi organizational changes. But we really hope to continue to support each other and work with them again in the future. I'd also just like to add that creative placemaking and public art processes and installations have the potential to uplift the neighborhood spirits, build community resilience, provide connection and hope, and add to the livability factor, while also supporting the local economy and supporting entrepreneurs, specifically artists. Research shows that communities with a vibrant cultural scene are more desirable to live in, have greater economic stability, and attract a more diverse and educated workforce. So with that, I would like to take a moment to thank the council for your ongoing support of your work, and I'd also like to thank our entire Creative Placemaking Commission for their work throughout the year. Thank you. Well, and thank you. And Congratulations for your work, not just this past year, but over the past couple of years, when it's been incredibly difficult to be able to do the type of work that you do, and it's been fantastic. It really has. It's, uh, uh, it's noticed, it's appreciated, and I couldn't agree more that great cities have great art. It's as simple as that, and I would like to think that the, the great art that we have in Bloomington is elevating the city in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, I will say the, the hometown poetry event was one of the coolest things that I've gone to as an elected <laughs> official. Thank you. And hope uh, it's on some future work plan, if not now, but in the future. And I also hope next time it's we have it in the biggest auditorium possible and it's broadcast far and wide because I can't tell you how many people, after I described it to them, they said, well, can I watch it on cable? So <laughs> we've, we've got to make sure that we highlight and amplify the great work of those uh, those poets. Uh, it was just, it was so much fun. It was, it was a great event. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Mayor. Council questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you've got, got planned. I'm very curious. Um, as you've, as you've, um, you have some new folks coming in in March as well, correct? 
Is we did. We have four new commissioners coming in at our March 1st meeting. Okay. All right. So um, I'm, it'll be really interesting to see what they think about the expansion of creative placemaking citywide. When you think about the direction that um, you uh, will be giving your commission and it, to the extent that we can provide you with direction, what are your focus areas there? How, how can we be helpful to you in defining what that um, what that expansion might need to look like, what your priorities you know, might be, et cetera? Thank you, council member. Yes, I think that during the development of this plan, we'll be engaging with multiple groups, in, including city council in whatever ways that we're able to. And the, and the commissioners are going to be a big part of navigating and helping put together that engagement plan itself. So as our consultant brings to us, these are our plans for engagement efforts. This is what the city wants to do in working in tandem with them. We'll be able to have a lot of opportunities for us to develop a vision. So it will be happening out in the community regularly, and that will be a year-long process just to pull that together. So it certainly won't be coming together in just a room, not even just in the Creative Placemaking Commission meetings. It will be happening throughout events focus groups, opportunities throughout the city for us to get your input, but also just make sure to that you're involved throughout the process. I'm very excited about that. I think it was a step in the right direction, I think, here um, for the for the city to consider um, that uh, uh, you know that the vibrancy of art throughout the city, uh, especially thinking about um, what we're doing in our with our parks master plan and and how those things dovetail so nicely together. So I'm very excited about that. The um, the uh, work that you're doing uh, over by Fire Station Three is a great example of of how those things can uh, come together really easily, right? Um, expanding especially on that green space initiative that you all have. So I'm excited about that. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I will say when, when I was at the University of Minnesota, I tried for three years to get sidewalk stamps <laughs> in the sidewalks there and failed. So I was very excited to see this move forward with the poetry, uh, the, the poetry entries for the creative, uh, the hometown poetry uh, contest. So well done on that. I think that was, that's a fantastic idea. So thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for your work. Please share our thanks. With the rest of the commission, welcome the new commissioners that you'll have coming on board here uh, shortly. And keep up the good work. Looking forward to continuing to see what you have in store for us. Wonderful. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Council Member. Thank you. Council, I realized what I need to do and didn't do it. Uh, we have to uh, officially approve and accept the, uh, the, the, work rep the annual report and the work plan of both the Advisory Board of Health and the Creative Placemaking Commission. So I'm sure uh, the city attorney is pulling your hair out right now, but we're going to double back quickly. And council, I would look for a motion to accept the Advisory Board of Health's 2022 annual report and the 2023 work plan as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Mua, to accept the Advisory Board of Health annual report and the work plan as presented. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council, similarly, I look for a motion to approve the Creative Placemaking Commission's 2023 work plan and meeting calendar. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Moore to accept the Creative Placemaking Commission's work plan and meeting calendar, and I'm assuming their work plan as well. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Apologize for missing that, Madam Attorney. Hope we're okay with that. I hope it's all good. We're all good. Moving on to item three on our agenda, that's a consent agenda tonight. Councilmember Carter has tonight's consent business. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I have a uh, hold on 3.2, but um, I don't have a hold. I just have a comment on a block of them. I don't know what the pro proper procedure is on that. There's nothing. I don't want to hold up the uh, the vote because I don't have anything particular. I just wanted to What I think we could do if we hold item 3.2, we'll get a motion in a second. And then if you wanted to have some discussion, uh, if you wanted to make general comments, that would be the appropriate time to do so. A after we do the. Uh, after we have the motion in the second before the vote. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Um. So just to clarify, I think what you were talking about was different agenda items, probably related to the grants and wanting to acknowledge those. So maybe, yes. so it wasn't really related to 3.2, it was related to all of the different youth 
sports grants that are going out through Hennepin County. Okay. I'm still happy to do it between the motion and second and the, if you say without further comments, I'll make my comment then, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay, we'll do that. Yep, perfect. Okay, so with that, I would move to approve 3.1 and then 3.3 3 through 3.13. I have a motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to accept the consent business as stated. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yes, I just wanted, I happened, the timeliness of this could could not be better. I was out with, uh, with uh, uh, to dinner with uh, Council Member or uh, Commissioner uh, Gotel not that long ago, she pleaded with us to uh, focus on getting uh, grants in because she knew that there was Hennepin County dollars that we could leverage to to further Bloomington's uh, you know great work in the Parks and Rec area. Um, I made a, a note to uh, Director uh, Ketri about it and said. Um, I'm sure you're on top of this. And she said, sure am, and here they are. And so I just I want to acknowledge that. I want to thank Commissioner Gotel for, for being on top of that, too, on our behalf, which is always great to make sure we know about those things and, of course, the great people in Parks and Rec on that. So uh, no, no further comment, just a thank you all around for quick work on that. Thanks. And I will second that, Council Member D'Alessandro, on both ends, uh, the, the great work of the city staff and Park and Rec, but also the uh, the advocacy and the work that Commissioner Gutell does for us, especially uh, securing Hennepin County grants for a variety of different options for the uh, city of Bloomington. So thank you for those comments. Council, we have a motion and a second to accept the consent business as stated. Any other comments this evening? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Item 3.2, Councilmember Moore. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to share um, that this past Friday, I went out to Olson Elementary School um, to observe for myself the concerns that have been brought up by residents and then school staff, uh, met with the principal and kind of talked through their concerns as well. Um, then <clears throat> I was out there watching traffic as they came in and out for middle school and elementary school, uh, and it's it's very apparent the challenges at that intersection. Uh, as I looked at the, the work plans, um, it doesn't clear up all of the concerns there. Um, I know we have staff on site today, um, but I know and I asked a lot of questions. And so um, I, I wanted to express that <clears throat> I do have concerns about the amount of time that we've worked on this. It spanned back to almost 2006, I believe it was. Um, conversations regarding this stretch of 102nd Street. And so I, I'm happy that we're doing something, um, but I wanna make sure we're keeping up with the urgency um, for the, the residents of that neighborhood, for the school, um, to make sure that we're, we're reevaluating that this is not the last thing we're gonna do for this stretch, and that we're going to be interacting and communicating with residents to make sure that they're, uh, they're on board with what we're trying to do to, to make this a safer corridor uh, moving forward. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you, Council Member Mu. I've, I've heard from residents in this neighborhood as well, and I think that it's on everybody's mind. I, I wanna ask a uh, follow-up on that. I think that as part of our traffic calming program, um, and or our active transportation plan, there are some levers in both of that work plan as well um, that may or may not come to bear on 102nd Street. And one specifically I think we talked about was um, the uh, the whether or not we might get a recommendation from staff about putting in a, a school zone uh you know, traffic zone at these some of these places that slow traffic way down when children are present, because we don't have any in Bloomington today. And I'm I'm just wondering. I haven't seen anything, so I don't know if that is. But can you confirm for me, Mr. City Manager, if if that's part of what the staff is currently working on in that plan? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, I cannot confirm for you, but I see that our City Engineer Julie Long is uh, coming forward to the microphone right now. Good evening, Ms. Long. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, while it is technically not part of our neighborhood traffic management plan because that is only focused on local streets, we understand that you can't have a speed limit discussion on local streets without also talking about, I'm going to use the fancy words of collectors and arterials. So we are planning on including that along with school traffic um, speed zones 
as part of our discussion that will be occurring with the neighborhood traffic management plan. We're trying not to confuse the public because we also have the active transportation action plan. So they're gonna hear from a lot of us and they're gonna be like, these plans are confusing. So we're trying to combine them but keep them separate, which is going to be a bit of a challenge, but we are looking at that. Oops, I don't know if, if um, Mr. Mayor, if, if Councilmember Mua has any particular insight into whether or not that was one of the thoughts or ideas that might have been present, but it would be, I think, something for us to consider going back to that particular community with to say, you know, we have these things on the table. Is, is that of interest to the folks there and things like that? So, uh, Thank you, Council, Member and, uh, Council members, and, and I agree with all of your, your comments and statements, and, and yes, I think everything should be on the table, and there should be a, a, a robust conversation within that community uh, regarding what the, the proposals might be. Uh, I wasn't around for the 2006 discussion, but I was around for the 2012 or 13 discussion, whenever that was, and uh, frankly was uh, surprised at that time at the, the the, the local opposition to, we were, it was going to be the, the put it on the road diet to have the uh, one lane in each direction with the middle turning lane, which is pretty common across the city. And the vocal opposition locally uh, led to the defeat of the, the proposal. And so I'm glad we're having this conversation again. And I think there's a lot of different possibilities that we could look at and consider. Uh, it kind of, um, it's, um, it is something that, I think needs to be done. Something needs to be done. The, the, the three lane roads we've seen before are, are successful. They slow traffic down. They uh, control left turns a lot better. They make it safer for pedestrians who are only tra having to cross uh, three as opposed to four lanes of traffic. There's a variety of good things that come with it. There are other options as well. I think that we could look at other possibilities, whether it's slower speed limits, whether it's X, Y, or Z, and I'd be open to that discussion. And I think that's why I, I like the, the staff report that I hope we see. I, I like the notion of working with the, the community to try and come up with the best solution for, the, for that community. And, um, and, and also working toward a, a common sense solution, a good common sense solution that, uh, that will keep people safe, especially our, our kids as they go to both elementary and, and high school in that area. Councilmember Moo, any additional questions? Uh, no, that's, that's it for me. Very good. If uh, if that's everything, I would look for a motion to adopt item 3.2 on your consent agenda. Yeah, I'd move to uh, adopt the resolution approving plans and specifications for the 2023-201 Olson Schools Safe Routes to School Site Improvement Project. Second. Motion by Councilmember Mua, second by Councilmember Martin to accept item 3.2 on your consent business. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much, Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Councilmember Moo and Councilmember D'Alessandro for the discussion on item 3.2. Item four on our agenda is our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, and we have but one this evening. Mr. Junker, good evening and welcome. This is item 4.1, a public hearing on a new therapeutic massage enterprise license, which might be among the last that we hear from you on these. Yeah, well, <clears throat> if things go as planned here, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's our uh, balanced uh, therapeutic massage. A uh, couple of people that met over our wonderful Northwestern Health Sciences and decided to, to go in together on this business. So, and actually one of them was licensed with us previous and I think COVID kind of ruined her plans, but now they found each other and we've got a, a new one. And, and you're familiar with this address because we've got many there. So um, everything's checked out. The inspection was just done on Friday. So we're just waiting for your approval tonight. Very good. It's, uh, it's good to hear that it's a local product out of Northwestern Health Sciences and staying in Bloomington. I'm very glad to hear that. Council, any questions of Mr. Junker on this one? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Junker. This is a public hearing, and I will call and open the public hearing on item 4.1, a new therapeutic massage enterprise license for balanced therapeutic massage. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak on item 4.1 this evening? Anyone? No one coming forward? Mr. Sable, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor, council members, no one on the phone. No one in the council chambers on the f or, or on the phone, council? I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.1. So moved. Second. Motion by council member D'Alessandro, second by council member Mua to close the public hearing on item 4.1. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council, unless there are questions or comments, concerns? Uh, on item 
Happy if not, I would look for action. Happy to make that motion. Council Member D'Alessandro. Mayor, sure thing. Um, I move to approve, oops, where are we at here? The Therapeutic Massage Enterprise License for Balance, Therapeutic Massage LLC. Second. Motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, second by Council Member Mua to approve the Therapeutic Massage Enterprise License for Balance Therapeutic Massage. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council item 5 on our agenda. Item is the organizational business and item 5.1 are city council policy and issue updates. I will kick it off. Uh, just recapping our listening session, another productive listening session I thought this evening. Interesting. Uh, we heard, uh, we had a visit from uh, representatives of the National Association of Hispanic Realtors and we heard from uh, Isaac Contreras. Uh, they were... Uh, in, uh, at our meeting to introduce themselves and offer uh, their help in any way that they might be able to help and, and basically to open the discussion, open the conversation. And um, sp uh, specifically, their organization is focusing uh, their mission on sustainable Hispanic home ownership. Uh, and love to continue the conversation with, uh, with that group and with the folks who attended this evening. So thank you to them for joining us tonight. Ms. Sally Ness joined us again and uh, was questioning uh, the zoning change that was made a couple of weeks, a couple months back as it relates to our colleges here in the city of Bloomington. We had a discussion and we agreed to answer a couple of questions that she brought forward, uh, specifically about the background uh, due diligence that took place uh, for the staff report prior to this uh, council uh, approving that change with a 7-0 vote. We heard from residents uh, from the Norman Ridge neighborhood, specifically Dan Curry and uh, Sandy uh, Himley? Himley, yep. I believe. Yep, Himley, thank you. Uh, they had questions uh, with the ongoing discussion that we've been having regarding proposed zoning changes to increase density in uh, the city of Bloomington and specifically as it applies to their neighborhood. And I believe that will come up before the council March in, 20th. So. on March 20th. Thank you very much. And then finally, Council, we had a, a brief conversation with Dwayne Brinkman. Dwayne, of course, is the treasurer of the Bloomington Remembers Veterans Organization. And uh, Dwayne brought some concerns to us regarding some comments that were made last week at the end of our meeting regarding the proposed location for the Bloomington Remembers Veterans Memorial, which, of course, as we know, is basically just to the east of City Hall between uh, uh, Civic Plaza and the pond that is on the east side of the, uh, the, the campus here. Uh, there was some discussion or concern by uh, a council member about the city's commitment to that location for the, the Veterans Memorial. Uh, and I, I want to say that, uh, I don't know, from my perspective, that the city is rock solid in that commitment to have that Veterans Memorial at the proposed location. I think it's a perfect location for it. It's a perfect complement here on our city campus. And uh, yes, there's a lot going on out there, and there will continue to be a lot going on. But uh, uh, I grew up uh, where there was a veterans park and everything from Memorial Day celebrations to funerals to baseball games to family picnics to teeter-totters took place in the park. And there was, uh, it was a perfect combination of everything that brought the community together. And I envision that to be the case with our veterans memorial here in, uh, on Bloom Bloomington Civic Plaza. Uh, the campus here tonight. Um, so uh, I don't know if, if the council has anything else to add. Uh, that, that was my interpretation of the, the uh, discussion that we kind of finished with last week. It was the discussion I think that we had this evening uh, after speaking with Mr. Brinkman. And I think it's the commitment that we've made as a city to this organization and I don't have any intention of backing out of that commitment right now. Very good. That was our listening session this evening. Again, once again, thanks for, to folks for participating in that listening session. A good productive one again tonight. Mr. Verbrugge, anything to add for us this evening? I do, Mr. Mayor. If you'd indulge me, I actually have a video that I would like to show. Uh, the council uh, identified being a little bit more proactive and strategic and uh, our communications, anticipating issues. And one thing we know that happens every year about this time is that uh, property tax... Uh, statements hit mailboxes and then shortly after that property valuation statements uh, hit mailboxes and uh, folks often uh, get a little confused about what the what the uh, notices mean and every year we explain it and we can never explain it enough so we thought this year uh, in anticipation of people opening their mail we'd put together some information for them uh, so if grant is ready back there grant why don't you go ahead and roll the video please
Hi, I'm Deputy Finance Officer Kari Carlson. And I'm City Assessor Tim Bolger. We are going to walk through two documents that will be arriving in mailboxes in March related to taxes and home valuations. I'll talk about the 2023 property tax statement and Tim will discuss the valuation notice. Every year, the county, city, and school district levy a total property tax dollar amount that is necessary to fund services. At the bottom of the 2023 property tax statement, there is a breakout of tax amount showing the portions that go to Hennepin County, the City of Bloomington, and the Bloomington School District. Each of these separate entities receives approximately a third of the total taxes. The City's 2023 property tax levy was set at $74.5 million, which was a 9.15% increase over 2022. I'm going to spend a little more time sharing you through what's different this year. Keeping a city running takes a lot of work and resources. Each year, department budgets and services are carefully studied to make sure services are meeting residents' needs and making progress on the community's mission to make Bloomington an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. To better understand residents' needs, last year, staff engaged with the public about the budget at seven different community events to learn more about what was important to residents when it came to the budget and city services. Along with that, the mayor and council discussed the budget with the community at five town hall forums last fall, as well as detailed discussions at several council meetings throughout the year. The results of the annual national community survey are also analyzed for budget topics. We heard from the community that public safety was a priority and the City Council made sure that was the top priority in the 2023 budget. 85% of the tax levy increase is an investment in police and fire services that includes new full-time police and fire positions, equipment, training, and funds for new fire station construction. For every dollar of city taxes paid, 50 cents go toward police and fire, 25 cents go toward public works, 16 cents goes to community development, community services, and parks and recreation, and the remaining nine cents goes to paying outstanding debt for roads reconstruction and building construction, such as the new fire station number four. The city's total proposed levy amount is spread out among properties based on their value and type of property. Minnesota property tax calculations are very complex, but basically properties that have higher values pay a higher portion of the tax levy. The 2023 tax statements are based on the property valuations that you received last year in March 2022. The 2024 budget process is just getting started. City staff will once again be out in the community this spring and summer gathering input from the public and bringing forward information and options to the City Council. Your property taxes in 2024 will be based on the 2023 property valuation notice, which Tim will walk you through now. Thanks, Kari. In addition to the 2023 property tax statements that Kari explained, 2023 property valuation notices are also mailed out in March. As Kari said, these will be used to determine your 2024 property taxes, but the time to question or appeal your classification or value is upon a receipt of that notice. The valuation notice will show your estimated market value, which is the value used to determine the amount of property taxes you will pay. The estimated market value of your property is determined by the city's assessing division and is based on the market conditions leading up to the assessment date of January 2nd each year. Our assessing division is responsible for accurately assessing 32,000 parcels of real estate in the city and determining their estimated market value, which is the most probable sale price if it were to be sold on the open market. If you believe that the property information on your valuation notice is not correct or believe the value to be inaccurate, you may appeal. Please call our office at 952-563-8722 to discuss your concerns with an assessor. If an inspection is needed, we can schedule an appointment with you. Although most concerns can be resolved by contacting our assessing division, there is also an option to appeal by attending the local Board of Appeal and Equalization. This meeting will be held in the City of Bloomington Council Chambers on Wednesday, April 19th at 6 p.m. The local Board of Appeal and Equalization is an appointed panel of Bloomington residents who are knowledgeable in real estate. They provide a fair and objective forum for property owners to appeal the valuation or classification of their properties. If after attending the local meeting, you are still not satisfied with the results, you can attend the Hennepin County Board of Appeal and Equalization. This will be held on Monday, June 12th at the Hennepin County Government Center in Minneapolis. They recommend that you call by May 17th to make an appointment for the meeting. By the way, these dates are also on the city's website. Remember, it's always best practice to contact the Bloomington Assessing Division first and as soon as you receive your valuation notice. Many concerns can be resolved informally by speaking with our team. Additionally, the state offers income-based property tax refunds for both homeowners and renters. 
There's also a non-income based property tax refund available for properties where there has been a large increase in taxes year over year. That state refund form is called the M1PR and can be found on the Minnesota Department of Revenue's website. If you have any questions about your valuation notice or questions about the state's property tax refund program, please contact the city's assessing division at 952-563-8722 or assessing at bloomingtonmn.gov and we'd be happy to help you. Thanks for watching. We're always trying to improve the ways we engage and communicate. If you have suggestions for how we can do better at getting resident input and sharing information, please don't hesitate to contact us with your ideas. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I also want to note uh, Mr. Bolger, our City Assessor, shared information with you last week when we were talking about our Board of Review and some changes we made just to the eligibility, uh, but just highlighting the really good work that that uh, group does every every year at this time last year we had about 800 calls that came in people with questions about their valuation or about their taxes and uh, only a couple of those ended up proceeding to the board of review um, because as mr bolger said in the video most of the questions that people have can be addressed in a phone call and so uh, we want to really encourage people uh, not to hesitate to call the city and ask. The numbers are on the forms, and they're always available on the website uh, that our staff is waiting and ready to help. Well, thank you for showing us that. I appreciate that. I appreciate the staff time. Uh, Ms. Carlson and Mr. Bolger, I thought, did a very nice job and good, straightforward information. And I think you're right. It, uh, it hits right in the bullseye of uh, some of the... Uh, discussions that we've been having trying to be proactive about uh, our our city services and some of the information going out and trying to answer questions ahead of time so well done thank you for doing that councilmember don Lissandro and then councilmember carter and specifically to this or, or individual or uh, i had a question for okay Mr. please Rubruti. i just wanted to make yeah, sure yeah thank please. you for asking for she that um i might have some other comments but that this was just about the sure. thing that uh, you know i think Kari always does a great job it's nice to see that happening um are there um, are there services uh, available to folks out of those offices if they would like to have an interpreter or have a translation support um, in case they want to ha have that conversation in Spanish or you know in in another language? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, yes, interpretive services would be available. Okay, great. Yep. Thanks. Additional questions specifically to uh, the assessing or the sales or the the property tax video. Okay, very good. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so that video was great, just have to say. Um, two things really quickly, uh, just a reminder again that Councilmember Mua and I have our town hall on Saturday morning from 10 to 11.30 at Creekside in the Minnesota Valley Room. Uh, so we're our goal is for this to be very family friendly and so uh, for those in the community who are watching, if you have kids, feel free to bring them along. We totally get it. Um, and so we're excited about it, and, um, and we'll probably be showing that video again because it's so good. Uh, the second thing, I know we've gotten a couple emails related to this, um, uh, and I'm wondering if we want to do something about it. So it's in regards to No Mo May, and uh, the city manager and I talked about this very briefly earlier, uh, but I do think there's an opportunity for us to just provide more clarity around what it is we allow and what it is we don't allow. And so... I do think it would be helpful for us to join other cities in just passing a resolution that clearly lays out, um, you know, what are the kind of criteria, what can people do, when, and it just seems like a pretty risk-free uh, thing to do, but then provide just more clarity and transparency to the community in terms of what, it, what do we allow. I, I, I would agree, Council Member, and I, we, I've received this year and in past years the no mo may uh, emails, and I, I would agree. I think if we laid it out very clearly what we're talking about, the time frame that we're talking about, and what exactly, how it should look and how it should all work, I, I think it would, it would work, and, and we wouldn't be... I don't want to say plowing new ground because that's kind of mixing metaphors here, but you know what I mean. Uh, in terms of, th there are other examples out there that we could simply copy, I think, and, and probably have a pretty solid guideline, a, a pretty solid foundation and guideline as to what we're trying to accomplish with this kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. And I would say, I think Adina passed one relatively recently that's, yep. I mean, I'm looking at it and it's, 
it's you know pretty straightforward. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter, uh, Emma Struss, our Sustainability Coordinator, I think has shared that uh, Dina resolution with our legal staff. I'm not sure if legal has had an opportunity to review it, but if Council wishes us to prepare a resolution, we can do that in relatively short order. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I mean, I certainly would be in favor of it. I would say that um, given given the research I, I did on this last year, I think um, that uh, for the most part, um, even if we don't know that we do, we kind of end up participating in it anyway in the sense that um, if, if somebody does have a lawn that can grow to over eight inches in, a, in May... <laughs> And that, you know, we might still have snow on the ground in May this year, but but if, if that does happen, um, you know, that first notice and that second notice, by that time that they they get enforced, it's June and people are starting to work on their lawns and things like that. So by, by default, I think, uh, you know, when I spoke with um, um, our environmental health manager, uh, Lynn, more about it, um, it seemed that, uh, you know, we... We could certainly make a. Re- I like the idea of a resolution. I put a sign in my yard every year about it. But, uh, but, but if we wanted to do something, I'd certainly support that. Um, I do think by default we we kind of get there anyway, just given the way that our our regulations today work. I, I do want to note that there is a state le- law um, moving through, albeit probably slowly, um, that that does um, provide. Um, um, authorization if you will for it makes it easier for neighborhoods and and localities to um to to pull back on some of the stringent um uh rules that might have been placed either at the hoa level or at the at the local level um on things like you know yards and and non-native species and things of that nature so that may also give some relief over time yeah thank you very good uh so council it it I, I've heard three. If I can see another nodding head to perhaps direct staff to move forward with this. Um, and again, to make sure that we've got a, a, an ordinance put together, strictly defined time frame, um, and to be able to, to not give just a, a carte blanche to let folks do whatever they want with their lawn, but to, to, um, to participate in the no mow as it's been outlined in the past. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. I, I would also suggest we um, prepare some sort of communication to tell what mo- no mo may is, um, given that not everyone is uh, aware of what it is and what it does uh, in the spring. So that would be something I would want to see along is with that. And, and I would agree. And, and like the ordinance itself, I know that that communication exists somewhere, and we can simply cut and paste a lot of that information as well. Okay. Okay. Um, we're good. Uh, no, I'm. We, we're good with. Oh yes. We're, we're good. Okay. We'll move forward. Perfect. Okay. Councilmember Dalessandro. Right, I'm sorry. Are we you done, Councilmember yes. Carter? Councilmember Dalessandro. <laughs> uh, just a quick question. One of the things that we've, um, I say traditionally done, and that's not true because I've only done it once. So how can that be a tradition? But um, uh, one of the things we have done, and I think we're with the with the replacement of of count uh of of council member mua and everything um we haven't done it i'm just curious if we're if we are are we through the work plans at this point or do we have some our our strategic initiatives and what we might want to try to focus on and is there any room left i know it's already march and i don't want to assume that we do or don't but there were a few things i think that you know we each of us might want to focus put a priority against or something to that effect that we haven't really done that work. And I was just curious if we, if, if we were planning to do, or if, you know, we just kind of said, well, never mind, or how that might work. Well, I, <laughs> thank, you, I, thank you, Councilmember Dallas. Thanks for that question. And I think the, at least my thinking was that as we got into this year and we're, as we look to really implement and put, bring to life our new strategic plan to, to focus along those lines and, have the work plans of the boards and commissions kind of bubble up uh, and, and the work plans of the departments kind of bubble up through the uh, new strategic plan and maybe and, and not do what, what you just described. I mean, a lot of times we've done it in the past and gone down in all seven and we end up with a list of 43 things of, of to-dos and, and great ideas, but it um, whether or not they specifically line up with our our board and commission work plans, staff work plans, or our uh, strategic plan wasn't always the case. And then we get to the end of the year and somebody would say, well, what about, I I said back in January, I said this, and we didn't get it done. And so I think there was always confusion about that, how it all all worked. Uh, my, My desire, my recommendation is 
for this year, we let the work plan, we, we let the uh, strategic plan continue to, to percolate and work forward with that, move forward with that. I do think there's room for what you've talked about. I don't know uh, at, at a council meeting if, or, at, or at the, um, the, the council staff gathering that we had where we all kind of sat around the table and everybody talked about good ideas and to work off of something along those lines. Uh, that way it's, um, it's, it's not just the list of 43, but we have a, a process of throwing it out there as possibilities, what everybody's thinking about and be able to narrow it down into, into specific projects and not only the specific projects, but how well then they fit into the strategic plan. Does that make sense? It's a uh, yes, sir, it does. And, and, and so um, I, I don't think that those, I think that that makes total sense. I would say, um, you know, there are, there have been a, a couple of, of, conversations that have just kind of percolated around uh, a few times that that if that they that may or may not be a part of that just given the fact that we haven't identified it as yep that actually maps to a strategic plan so I guess maybe the, the question I have is now that if we do have all of the the department work plans and we have the commission work plans is there a way that we can get that stuff mapped to those strategic priorities in a way that helps us I don't want to burden anybody but to say like okay here's all the work and here's how it maps you know we have six things that that hit objective a and five things that hit objective b etc and i think that would help at least for me in my personal like tracking list to know whether or not any these things are on there or not comparatively if that makes sense yeah mr verbrugge uh, you've got the uh, experience with this type of strategic planning process and and the uh, the staff work that goes along with it um uh, how does that all work together like that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, we'll actually see the BTT work plan coming back to Council in April. Uh, we're hoping to have it the first meeting in April, which is also our hoped-for uh, go-live date on our dashboard. So we're going to try and hit those marks. Now, um, what... What you're suggesting in, turn of, in terms of like most of the initiatives that we have and slotting them in the context of the BTT, um, I haven't done that before. We're, we're identifying work plan of items and initiatives that have been identified in the course of um, discussing the, the strategic plan itself. And we also recognize that a lot of the work that we are doing fits within there too. Um, so we can take a look at staff in terms of how we try to um, just – align and identify those things um, because I think there is some sense in doing that. One of the, one of the things that we've talked about is when we bring forward uh, items to the council for consideration is identifying how those items fit within the strategic plan. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good thing to do. And I also know that in past experience, we got to the point in, in some other cities that I worked in where maybe we were identifying like um, valve replacements in water sewer projects as being related to uh, some part of the strategic plan. And the, it's, that's not the case. It's part of something that we have to do because if it breaks, then things really go badly, right? It's just so, you know, I don't want folks to think that they have to justify every item coming to the council as being consistent with strategic plan. But there's clearly work that we do that we want to make sure that we demonstrate the alignment. And frankly, when council is making decisions about where you're allocating time and money, um, I, I think that's the very first question you should be asking is how does this advance the, the future that we're striving for. And, and I will point out, uh, Council Member, it's, it's not as though the door is slammed completely because we just had an example of adopting no mo may, no mo may or, or directing staff to, to take a look at no mo may uh, as, a, as, a, as a path forward. So it's, uh, it, it's not a complete um, slam dunk that... We, there, there will be nothing new beyond what we've talked about because obviously something else could come up. There, there are ideas that come along. Um, I would just ask the council to be um, judicious with that and maybe respect the work plans that we already have in place and, and the work that I know our very busy staff is already doing and to, to consider them as we, as we talk about what we could possibly add on to their, to their busy schedules. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just uh, briefly, and this I feel like uh, comes up every couple of years, but it, it, at some point being purposeful about holding empty space in some of the boards and commissions work plans. I mean, for example, we just had a neighborhood come forward with environmental issues around a potential zoning change. Would be great to kick that to sustainability, say ask the experts, come back with a recommendation. Um, it's easier said than done. We have very ambitious boards and commissions, but uh, some for future years. Uh, that's a good point too, Council Member. Appreciate that. Council, anything additional? 
Uh, I forgot to mention, and I will just clarify, and you'll hear all about it in the council minute this week, but uh, our action last week to approve travel spending very quickly for me. Uh, just a, a quick recap, uh, on Tuesday morning, made the plane reservations, was in the air by Tuesday afternoon to Washington, and on Wednesday morning, uh, took part in a, uh, a forum at the White House on federal spending and the use of federal dollars within communities, within cities and counties and so on. And uh, was very glad to and proud to represent Bloomington and talk about the work that we had done with our um, American Rescue Plan funds, with our, um, what were some of the other? The ILGA, the, the, the infrastructure. Infrastructure, thank you. Uh, the infrastructure funding and so on. But to talk about how the we, we used $850,000 to give loans to 150 businesses during the pandemic to keep them afloat to how we uh, assigned about $6 million in federal funding toward uh, low-income housing initiatives within the city of Bloomington. Uh, a variety of things like that. And I was there with, with a group of uh, uh, city officials, with county officials, nonprofits, uh, union representatives, and so on, all with the opportunity to talk about how this was used and to interact with each other and discuss about how it possibly could have been done better, but also to, to recollect how uh, it was used and used uh, effectively and how we could possibly interact or inter, um, interweave some of the work that we are doing. And so it was a, uh, it, it was a, a good day-long conference. I was back home by Thursday night. Um, I've earned these bags under my eyes in a lot of different ways. Um, and, but it was, it was definitely worth being there and, and having the discussion. And yes, uh, we were in the White House. I was among Minnesota officials. So yes, I brought up Expo more than once. And, and actually, a lot of folks who came in and talked to us, uh, who represented the administration, the Biden administration, at least three of them led off their remarks with, with a, a question or a comment about the Expo. So it's good to know that uh, the, the folks in the White House and in the administration are well aware of our efforts here and are very supportive of the work that we're doing. So just wanted to give you, that, that's kind of the, the high-level view, and like I said, I'll get some more information out in the council minute this week so you can understand a bit better the reason for the trip and the outcomes. All right. Council, no further council business this evening. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Right. Motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to adjourn this evening's meeting. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much, Council, for the discussion. Thank you, staff. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and who participated tonight. Have a good rest of your evening.